In the last episode, we talked about one of the main privileges of being a cruiser, and that is to go to places people seldom ever see or even know about. In this episode, one of the other great privileges that we're about to talk about is meeting new people, discovering new cultures, and learning a little bit of history along the way. This episode is the story of two people who met on an island, became friends, and then fell out. And no, we are not talking about Liz and me. <laughs> now, this is the story of John Herbert Harrington, who worked for the British East India Company, and a Sulu prince, that's Sulu, S-U-L-U, not Zulu, a Sulu prince called Tetin. The other interesting person you're going to meet is Craig. Now, he's a Brit who's been living in this area for many years. He and his local girlfriend, Josephine, have been visiting Ballenbangen and studying its historical context and the British settlement that was there. Yes, once again, good old British colonialism. So here we are at Pulau Ballenbangen, Ballenbangen Island. And this morning, we are gonna be looking at the remnants of the East India Company's most eastern outpost that was destroyed in 1775 by a band of Sulu warriors. Uh, it was revisited again in 1802, but again doomed to failure and was later abandoned in 1805. So, onward, off we go. In 1772, the British arrived and the Spanish were a bit concerned because of course the Spaniards had the whole of the Philippines and this was formerly the Philippines. Prior to 1772, the British had fought the Spaniards and sacked Manila and rescued the Sulu prince and the Sultan from jail there oh. and reinstalled them on the throne of, of Sulu. So in return, the Sultan of Sulu gave Balambangan to the British for all time. <laughs> um, so that, do we still own it? <laughs> no, we, unfortunately we gave it away after the war. <laughs> time went by, a new Sultan came on the throne who was more sympathetic to the Spanish. Mm. And when the fort was going to come into being and the British had arrived, he wanted someone there to keep an eye on them. And he sent his nephew, who was a Sultan Prince by the name of Tetin. Now Tetin was to masquerade as a carpenter. Although he was a prince, John Herbert soon recognised that he was a, a leader of men. He was only 22 years old, a strapping young man, apparently by all accounts, tall, handsome, charismatic. And John Herbert made him the head gaffer for all the locals to help run the locals in the construction of the houses. Tetin was quite nicely planted as the leader of the natives. Unfortunately, he got a bit of a liking of the British lifestyle. Now, John Herbert was known for his extravagance and he was also allegedly embezzling hundreds of thousands of pounds from the East India Company. So Tetin adopted this lifestyle and started running up a debt a debt he could ill afford on a carpenter's salary. Tetin had this debt that he couldn't pay. So in a, in a rage, John Herbert put him in stocks and embarrassed him in front of everybody. Later, when he was held to court by the Sultan, said, I was just dishonored in such a way I had to retaliate. So Tetin went back to Sulu, or Zamboanga, as it is now, and plotted his revenge. He knew the British had a full garrison here, Indian troops, British tr officers, he knew he had to time the attack to perfection, so he did. At dawn, the morning after John Herbert's birthday, when he knew all the officers would be a bit hazy. Also, when there was no warships in the bay, all the warships were on patrol. So they raided at dawn, but the British thought in their arrogance they could never be attacked from behind. The Sulus, 300 of them, spent the whole night in one boat going to and forth from Bangui, bringing their, their band of warriors, and they attacked from the rear, the British had nine cannon, all facing the sea, and was fortified to the sea with a stockade, but nothing in the rear. It was all thick scrub, and the, the British thought, oh, no one's ever gonna attack from behind, that's just not cricket. Which they did, and then they attacked from where we are now, just a little way up the beach, and to one side, uh, this, this southern side. And they very quickly overrun the guns. And once they got control of the guns, it was all over. Then they started firing indiscriminately at all the Chinese village on the front, the Malays, everybody. The British fled, everything went amiss. John Herbert's house, which is about another mile down there, they fled and that ship was the only one surviving. The ill soldiers that were in the, in the hospital, they were all speared. They lost everything. 
in terms of the day, was 975,000 Spanish dollars in loss of cannons, of munitions, of wealth, of ships. It was a huge loss for the East India Company. There was no records kept of the accounts of where the money was gone or where it was lost. John Herbert, and he was under investigation for years. He actually fled to India, and it was about a good 10 years before the East India Company called up with him, and he was brought back to the UK to face account of what had happened. But he was never charged, there was no evidence, and to my knowledge, he died a poor man in the UK. But that, that needs to be investigated further. The Brits came again in 1802, okay. and they say Penang was almost emptied when everyone left. It became a, a ghost island, because they all came here. But again, the remoteness, nothing grew in this salty, arid area, and the crops failed. They had to send boats to Bangui, down to Marudu, to try and get food. It was just another disaster. Yeah. Lack of water, sickness, yeah. and 1805, they just pack up bags and left. It was another failure. Yeah. In the end, Singapore became the hub that it is now. So what was that dusk shot all about then? Yeah, that dusk shot, the drone shot, was a big storm that came in that, that day. Do you remember? Uh, it, was, it was one of the most incredible, one of the most visually impactful storms we've ever seen. And that shot was looking over uh, Bangui, the next island. Yeah. So after that very, very hot day of walking around that arid island, uh, it sort of closed with this amazing vista, mm. at least from the drone anyway. Mm. Talking of arid though, I mean, Balambangan, of course, very few people live there now. It's just the Bajau Laut that are settled there. And as Craig said in that video, it's desolate, you know, it's very difficult yeah. to grow plants. And Although there are plants and trees mm. growing there, and we saw some amazing flowers, some of those um, flowers that eat other animals, the pitcher plants and mm. things like that. Yeah, lots of flora and fauna on that island. Yeah, and we, we hope that you got a little taste of that because we put in quite a few shots of that. Yeah. But whilst we're here, we should thank Craig actually for yeah. his time. He didn't have to do that. Uh, he, by his own admission, he was a bit hung over. <laughs> <laughs> and I shoved that, uh, the lav mic on him and said, right, come on, tell us about the island. <laughs> so he is so knowledgeable about yeah. that area. And uh, it's, as, as we said in the introduction, this is one of the privileges, is meeting other yachtes yeah. who have this kind of knowledge and yes. are, are willing to share that knowledge with we, the rest of us. Yeah, I mean, we learned something that we had no idea. We hadn't been taught about it. We didn't know anything about it. So it's a real revelation to us. Yeah, well, I think, I think the funny thing is, of course, as Brits, you know, we're the, the sort of colonial side of British history were taught from a very skewed angle. And what I liked about Craig's uh, uh, recount of that story was he, he made absolutely no apologies for the Sulu behaviour, who perhaps quite rightly fought for the rights to their own island yeah. and um, admitted that, yes, once again, the British uh, colonials, uh, they cocked it up again. And, uh, you know, it was a big loss to them. They so did. thank you, Craig. And by the way, if you see ads, one of those nasty mid-rolls is about to appear right now. Pulau Balambangan, that's where we've just been for the last week and it's been a fantastic week. We've been in caves that nobody ever sees. We've seen 18th century sites or remains of sites. All kinds of unusual plants, saw a huge python. Um, didn't actually go in the water because I got scared because there are a lot of crocodiles over there. Maybe when we go back I'll try going in the water. But yeah, it's been a really fabulous break up here near Kudat. And we're now back to Kudat. We're on our way back having to motor sail because there's uh, not much wind and what there is is going the wrong way, as usual. Um, when we get back we hope to be hauling out. but. For the last couple of hours I've had the line out, nothing's happened and I'm thinking I might just change the lure, see if we can get something before we arrive back in Kudat.